And I would like to introduce Stacy Phillips, who is going to talk about assistive technology um, in IEPs for students. And um, Stacy, welcome to Disability Pride Virtual PA. We're so happy to have you, and we are ready to learn. Good morning, Connie. This is Stacy. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be here. I would love to meet with all the families in person. Um, as we know, it's been a really challenging year, uh, but this is the next best thing. So uh, I am going to share my screen and go through the presentation. I will also be sharing my presentation uh, with the Disability Pride team. So if you would like a copy of it, which if this is something that is near and dear to you, um, I would definitely recommend that you ask for a copy of it. I've included a lot of resources and links for you um, to get support in this area of assistive technology related to your child or student's IEP. Um, and I will make sure that any acronyms that I use, I will define throughout. And all images in the presentation are alt text um, if you need that. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So assist in the IEP access for all. They see IEP. we don't see anything on the screen. There you go. You good? Yes. Great. It took a moment, sorry. <laughs> okay, so assistive technology in the IEP. IEP stands for Individualized Education Plan. So any student receiving special education services in the school district or where, whatever school they are attending would have an IEP written with the parents, guardians, and the special education team. On the first slide, there are just some examples of assistive technology, a slant board with a paper and a hand writing on there, a timer or countdown clock that has white and red to denote the time that's elapsed, and a tablet like an iPad, not the same. Um, so I'm gonna introduce myself, just give you a little bit about me. Uh, prior to working at Temple University at the Institute on Disabilities, I was a special education teacher. I worked in autism support as well as general special ed. My background is um, in sign language. I do have a sign language certification. My undergrad and graduate degrees are both in special education. Um, I've been at Temple for six years, and the majority of my job, my role, is to provide communication assessments for adults who are deaf and also have intellectual disabilities. I am also the outreach coordinator for another project called I Can Connect PA, and that is an equipment program for individuals who are both deaf and blind. And for the last year and a half, I have also served as the co-chair for the Pennsylvania Deafblind Advisory Committee. And we work very closely with PATAN, providing recommendations to the Bureau of Special Education in Pennsylvania. So that's just a little bit about me. So today, our learning objectives, um, we're going to talk about what is assistive technology, AT. I'm going to refer to it as AT mostly, so I don't have to say assistive technology every time. I wanted to go over the AT continuum with you, um, talking about various forms of technology. I'm going to talk about the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA. 
and those requirements related to AT. Um, understanding the considerations and what goes into that process. It is definitely a team process and a team decision-making process. So it's important that we talk about that in case you are a parent going through this or a guardian. And how to incorporate assistive technology into the IEP. It is twofold. Devices and services are part of that process. And lastly, I'm going to provide you with a lot of resources, as I mentioned earlier. This can be a daunting task to really make sure that your student has what they need in forms of AT. And there are so many resources out there that even school staff are not aware of. So I wanna make sure that you have the tools that you need to really feel confident when you go into an IEP meeting and you're advocating for your student or your child. Again, questions are welcome. Um, if you think of things throughout and you want to type them in the chat, uh, Connie and Vicki, I'm sure will share those with me, um, but I will leave plenty of time at the end to answer all of your questions. Okay. So before we talk about assistive technology, I want to define assistive technology. So um, any item, piece of equipment or product system, whether acquired commercially, modified or customized that is used to increase, maintain or improve the functional capacities of a child with a disability. That is the definition by the Assistive Technology Act, the AT Act. So a lot of times people think of AT as only the customizable things or very specific. But as you can see here, they've really broken it down to lots of different types of equipment. And then the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act also says that AT encompasses no tech, low tech to high tech devices. It may also mean generic technologies used for a student with a disability. And that is their definition of AT. And most often that is what um, special education teachers use as a reference for that, for that definition. On the screen, there is a picture, a box that says assistive technology, and there are different e types of equipment in that box, including phones, hearing aids, personal listening system, a braille device, and uh, specialized computers. So now we're going to talk about assistive technology continuum. Assistive technology starts with no tech. Most people do not think of AT in this realm. They always immediately go to the really complex devices. But assistive technology really is across the spectrum. So no tech can be simple modifications. They're inexpensive, ready to use affordable tools. These are things that you could purchase yourself at the dollar store or stores like Five Below. So highlighter markers, large rubber bands, um, anything that you can purchase on your own to modify something can be thought of as no tech. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was a special education teacher, I had a student when I worked one-on-one -on -one with him that would kick his legs repeatedly under the desk. And so my shins would be bruised unless I scooched back from him pretty often. So I bought very large rubber bands and I put them across the legs of his desk 
and I stacked them on top of one another, about eight of them, six or eight of them. And so when he kicked, he was getting that stimulation that he wanted by kicking the rubber bands and then his foot would come back and that way he couldn't reach me. And so he was still getting what he needed from that input, but it wasn't hurting me in the process. So those large rubber bands was a really simple, inexpensive fix that would be considered no tech assistive technology. I'm going to provide more examples as we move on, but I just wanna go through the continuum first. Okay, so the next one is low or light tech. Low or light tech, um, sometimes it's referred to as both, would be less sophisticated. These are devices that are easy to learn. They're readily available. They don't take um, training or um, much to learn how to use them. And they're very affordable. This could be some sort of toy that you just pop in a battery, for instance. Okay, next one is medium tech. Sometimes I refer to that as mid tech, just so you know. So these are items that might cost more and they do require some training. They're gonna be relatively complicated mechanical devices, but not so complex that it would take an ongoing training. Um, and I'll go through those examples as well. And on the high end, is our high tech. When I tell people I work in assistive technology, this is usually where their mind automatically goes. They're like, oh, high tech. Oh, it's complex. It's a communication device. It's a designated device. It's going to be expensive. <clears throat> Excuse me. So these are going to be very advanced technology. They may need specific ongoing support and training. Um, and they can be uh, customizable. They're going to be digital. They're going to be electronic. You're not going to see something that isn't electronic deemed as high tech. Um, these may require a specific therapist to work with you to learn how to use them. For instance, a, a speech and language pathologist who's trained in augmentative and alternative communication or AAC they may need to work with you on a communication output device. Okay. Sorry. Okay, so examples. These are some of those no tech examples that I mentioned that you can purchase at a dollar store, five below, places like this, highlighter markers. A lot of us use highlighters um, to, you know, just highlight things that we're reading to draw attention to it so that we don't forget. But when we're using highlighters for assistive technology, this may be the difference for a student who has a processing delay or difficulty with reading or difficulty with dyslexia or math that if you highlight certain aspects, it helps them to focus. There's also um, a lot of individuals with dyslexia, dysgraphia that um, can, can read better or process things easier if they're in different colors. So even um, colored paper can be used as a no tech assistive technology tools. So on the left, there's various highlighter markers and on the right side of the screen, there are several different, there's five different pencils with different style pencil grips. These are really easy to um, help someone who has a fine motor difficulty, um, sometimes even larger pencils with the pencil grip really helps children who are having a hard time writing so that they can easily hold those pencils. So this would be considered no tech. All right, and then we're moving into low or light tech. Uh, most of the time, these are items that are specifically used for assistive technology. 
they may cost still low cost, but a little bit more than the no tech. Uh, they may require a battery. So on the screen, we've got a blue slant board. Slant boards can be used um, for individuals who have low vision so that the information is actually brought closer to their so visually. It can be used for someone who has a fine motor difficulty. It can be used for children or adults who are in a wheelchair that have a tray so that it's easier for them to write. So this can be used for a lot of different things. Um, I actually use these as well for students with um, ADHD, um, attention deficit disorder. So if they couldn't sit still and couldn't sit to complete their work, I would allow them to grab a slant board or a different clipboard so they can still do their work and walk around the classroom. Um, as long as the work was getting done. So these are simple fixes that we can do just that make a huge difference. In the center, there's various switches of different colors. Um, a switch can be connected to toys um, to answer a question, um, and we can switch activate a lot of different devices. It only requires a battery and it's pretty a simple fix. On the right, there are guides with clear, different colored windows. And again, for someone who has a reading disorder, delay, um, dyslexia, et cetera, they can use this just to help them keep their place um, in reading. On the bottom left, there is uh, highlighted raised paper. So this paper has raised lines on the solid lines and on the dotted line throughout the middle. And again, can help students who need occupational therapy or have some fine motor difficulties. In the middle, we've got a weighted vest. Um, anyone needing some sort of grounding or sensory input, a weighted vest can really help a, a child or a student who just needs that grounding. And, and sometimes it can mean they only wear it for a short time and they take it off. This would be another example of low tech technology. And finally on the bottom right is a communication board. This is a simple board. It can be made um, on your computer. It can be laminated for longer use and any pictures that maybe a child or student is using on a designated communication device can also be transferred over. Um, this is for students who possibly do not use their voice to communicate, or even if they do, um, a lot of times um, if a child is in distress and they're having a really difficult time finding the words to communicate, a communication board nearby can really help um, someone who has oppositional defiance disorder um, or ODD or tantrums or is in a moment of distress. Um, this can be used as an alternative. Do we have any questions so far? Vicki, did you? I don't know if you wanted me to stop. No, we're me. good. Okay, thank you. All right, so we're moving on to mid tech um, or medium tech is the other way that people describe it. And these are gonna be a little bit more complicated devices. They are going to be a little bit more expensive. They may require some training in order to program them and to teach your student how to use them. Again, they're probably going to be battery operated, but they may need to be charged. Um, so they may come with a plug. But again, they are going to be things that are fairly easy to learn um, were the person teaching uh, someone how to use it. And so here on the top left is another example of a switch, a big red, a big red switch. Um, and that 
could have a voice output that can be changed uh, when needed. Um, and can be connected to other devices to operate them with a simple push. Um, top right is a switch activated toy, I believe. I actually forgot what that was, sorry. <laughs> uh, yes, it's a switch activated toy. Uh, on the bottom left, um, you might have had a speak and say um, when you were a child where you pull the drawstring and it, the spinner spins around and maybe it hits on a farm animal and then it would say the cow says moo or something to that effect. Um, these can be adapted to teach vocabulary, uh, to assist in gameplay. Um, a lot of students, especially uh, on the autism spectrum, Play is not something that necessarily comes naturally. And so you're teaching specific um, goals by using assistive technology. Something like this could support. Um, and on the device, there's various pictures around that are holiday themed. And in the center, there are numbers on a dice, a die. And um, so you could use this in conjunction with an actual dice that you roll or a student that may need some support could just use this and whatever they land on, whatever number die they land on, um, that's what you would use. So it's just like a fun little way to incorporate assistive technology. And on the bottom right is something called a GoTalk 20. Um, this is for someone who would need an, a speech communication device. They can be changed. They are usually come with multiple sheets that you slide in and out on the side. And when the button is pushed, whatever button they push, there's a voice output. So it, this is a device that doesn't have a lot of um, programming um, capabilities. It's fairly simple. There's volume control, there's an on off switch, and it does require to be charged. This is something that I saw pretty often when I was teaching, but now the technology has gotten so uh, advanced and is ever changing that we don't generally see things like this too much. But it still can benefit, especially younger children who are just learning to communicate using a communication device. Okay, so here's the high-tech devices. And as I mentioned, nine times out of 10, when I mention high-tech technology or assistive technology, this is kind of what people assume. These are all more complex devices here. Um, smart home technology, um, things that are gonna cost a lot more money. They may not be able to be purchased off the shelf. They're gonna be customizable. Um, they're going to be designated communication devices. So on the screen, that's what you have, a designated communication device, an eye tracking device for someone who would use an eye gaze or a computer with their eyes to track um, and type uh, out what they wanted to do. There's a braille device at the bottom, the human wear braille device, um, and a... a tablet uh, that is a de another designated communication device, sorry. So these are gonna be difficult to obtain and there are a lot of barriers to obtaining assistive technology. If you've already been through this process, you probably are aware of this. So when a child's in school, it's not as difficult to obtain these devices um, because you have the support of the special education team and you possibly have support through um, the intermediate unit or the school district that your child is in. Um, and then when a child's not in school or when they've transitioned beyond school, obtaining devices is more of a process of trying to get funding through the medical insurance agency. And so it's important to have all those resources at your fingertips so that you know what you're looking for. Okay. 
So I'm going to move on to the next section where I'm going to talk about services and considerations. And that's how the IEP generally defines assistive technology and breaks it down, not only the consideration of what they need, what a child needs, but those services attached. Okay. So assistive technology services is defined as any service that directly assists a child with a disability in the selection, acquisition, or use of an assistive technology device. And assistive technology services are those that are necessary to enable the student or the IEP team to use any AT specified. So this is the definition provided uh, in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act or IDEA. Um, a lot of times schools do not have the means to support the child with a disability using assistive technology. Um, it's no fault of their own, but a lot of programs don't focus on technology. Uh, special education, uh, speech and language pathologists, excuse me, special ed teachers, um, a lot of them don't have the ability to train specific types of AT. And again, that a lot of that is because AT is ever changing and, and rapidly. Um, and so services may need to be obtained outside of the school and outside of the district. Okay, so what goes into this process? AT services. So there needs to be an evaluation of AT needs. Sometimes this can be done by a school staff. It depends um, if the team has expertise in this area. If they don't, an outside assistive technology consultant can be obtained. Um, families have a right if they don't feel that they're getting what they need to contact an agency to get an outside um, evaluation done. I know that there are several hospitals across the state that do this, Children's Hospitals, St. Joseph's Hospital. Um, there's other ways of doing this. So even in our office at the Institute on Disabilities, um, we can do various forms of AT consults and evaluations. Um, services also includes purchasing, leasing, or providing for the acquisition of AT. So getting those services to help you either borrow that device or purchase that device. And then selection. So selecting the right device is not always the first time. Let's choose something, it works, great, let's move on. There are times where it may be a trial and error. So try a device, okay, this works for some things but not others, let's try something else. So it's always a process, it's not a one-time shot. Um, so designing, fitting, customizing, or adapting those AT devices. And adapting is an important part of this process. So that's why the higher tech are more specified and customizable and can be adapted to meet the student's needs. Coordinating and using other therapies or interventions with those devices. So for instance, a child who does not use speech to communicate who has a learning disability, who may be on the autism spectrum. That is a child who might require a speech and language therapist, an occupational therapist to help with writing and mobility, a physical therapist to support um, building strength and uh, other types of mobility and walking and running, those types of things. So it, it's not just a one-time or a one-person team. It is a team effort. Um, so coordinating those therapies to support a student and also connecting that to those AT, that assistive technology device or devices. Um, and the last one is training or technical assistance. So um, as a parent, you may not be familiar with assistive technology. So in order for you to help your student, you're going to need training as well um, so that you can then support them and model that uh, device and model that behavior. So again, it is a team effort. 
Okay. So that was services. I know this is a lot of information, but I really wanted to make sure that you have what you need to go in and be the best advocate. And so digest it as you can and know that I'm going to be sending the, the PowerPoint out to you so you can revisit it as you need. Um, okay, so considerations. So every IEP team has to consider assistive technology. It's one of the first questions in the IEP, it asks, have you considered assistive technology and would it support this child, yes or no? Um, and so that is something that has to go into every IEP, into the development, the review, and the revision. IEPs are done on an annual basis and every year, this is a question that should be asked. And if the IEP team is not asking this question, then you as the parent guardian advocate should be. And if you believe that your student would benefit from the use of some sort of AT, even if it's no tech, then you wanna make sure that they are getting what they need. Uh, keep in mind that consideration is a collaborative process. So working with the, the IEP team, working with an AT specialist, or speech and language pathologists, making sure that you're asking these questions to, be, to ensure that they've considered whether assistive technology would benefit your child. All right, so I'm gonna talk about what does that actually mean, consideration. So it is not specifically defined in the IDEA, but the word considered means given careful and deliberate thought. So this is something that you definitely should advocate for only because a lot of times the IEP or special ed teacher is not familiar with assistive technology. And so they may think that they've considered it, but if they're not familiar, they might not be considering all aspects of the assistive technology process. Um, so you want to ask, is it appropriate? Um, would the IEP team, do they need to consider um, something called the set, which is the looking at the student, the environment, the, the way that things are set up. Um, and this includes general education access needs. If your student is getting part-time or itinerant special education services, they're spending part of the day in the regular ed room. They're spending part of the time in a special education room. It's possible that they may need assistive technology only in one area to support their needs, but that would allow them to access the general education cur curriculum. So when you're talking about consideration, you have to think about all these different areas. And throughout the IEP, this question is asked often in different ways. Also accessing um, benchmarks, which is like testing, those various tests that come out throughout the year, building this into their goals and objectives, it's an important process. So this is like the full range of assistive technology possibilities, looking at every aspect of the school day, not just the classroom, across all settings, what assistive technology allow this student to access their peers, their curriculum um, in other ways that they maybe couldn't before. Okay, so when does this occur? I've already mentioned that it should occur as part of the IEP meeting, but it should also occur the first time they have an evaluation or if they have a three-year reevaluation, um, I believe. Students with autism uh, get reevaluated every two years, and anyone else with an IEP um, and has you know, intellectual disability or speech and language impairment, it's every three years. So, this consideration for AT should occur at all of these points. Um, when planning accommodations for high stakes testing, so that would be the um, PSSAs or the ASA, the PASA, that's the testing done in Pennsylvania. When planning those accommodations, saying, okay, what will my student need 
in order to take this test and what would be the best scenario for them. A lot of times people think about extended time, they get frequent breaks, they can take the test in a separate room, um, they may need special pencils with pencil grips to assist them, but I think oftentimes we forget to say, would some form of assistive technology also support the student? So it's important that it happens often and it happens across this span. Um, also as part of transition planning. So transition happens at several different points throughout a student's school life. It's not just, oh, they're 14 and they're gonna transition to high school or at the age of 18 or 21, they're gonna be transitioning into post-school life. There's other transitions that take place, um, whether it be switching schools from an elementary to a middle school or a middle to a high school, depending on where you live, depending on what school your student uh, attends, there may be a lot of different transitions. And so the AT conversation should also happen as part of that transition plan. Okay, so what it looks like. Possible outcomes for consideration. In the IEP, it's gonna ask the outcome. It's gonna say, student independently accomplishes tasks in all instructional areas. AT is not necessary as part of the IEP for the students. If the teacher checks no on the IEP, then that means that no assistive technology is required. The next one says, AT is already in place and is effective and sufficient for the student as specified in the IEP, then that teacher should be checking yes on the IEP. And that means that assistive technology is needed and should continue. And the last one says, oh, hold on, my, my toolbar was blocking my view, my apologies. Um, student does not successfully accomplish tasks in all instructional areas, student may need IEP, AT, excuse me. So then the teacher would check yes on the IEP and then the team would need more information on the need and the benefit of AT. And then that process of seeking a consultation, getting an evaluation for AT, and then really looking at what does the student need to be able to do and what types of AT might support them? In which case, then you can start trialing assistive technology for various curricular tasks, data collection, and um, that way the, the teacher's collecting data, the speech and language pathologist would be collecting data or any other um, special education provider that is working with your student. They're looking at trialing the device, collecting the data, and that way they can determine, is this an effective use? Is this an effective tool? Should we incorporate this into their IEP? And so this is kind of what it looks like for the special ed team. Sorry, I went backwards. <laughs> okay, so assessment, AT assessment, assessing their needs. So there's no standardized tool across the United States to assess AT needs. Um, it's something that our team has looked at and talked about often um, how to do this, but it is very challenging because many students need lots of different AT to support them um, and some only need one. Um, it's hard to look at every child or create a tool that would apply to every child across the board. So there is no standardized tool. Um, and that's, I think, another reason to even, even more so to be an advocate. Um, I do have a child with a disability. Um, he right now does not require any assistive technology, but it's something that I think about often to keep him on track, to keep him organized and on task. Um, he does receive 
various therapies and services, um, but I'm always thinking and asking those questions. I tend to write them down before the IEP meeting so I don't forget. Um, but just thinking about the, this assistive technology in the back of your mind when you're going through the IEP process, I think is beneficial. So the assessment, it's a process, not an event. I've mentioned this a few times, um, that it is a process. It's ongoing. It's not a one-time deal. So it's not an event, okay? It's everybody's business. It is the business of the, the school staff, it is the family's business, it is the student's business. You definitely wanna get them involved if they're at an age and they're able um, to get involved. Everyone who works with your child in that school, whether it be the art teacher, the gym teacher, the special education teacher, the general education teacher, it's everyone's business. Everyone has a stake in making sure that that student is getting what they need. And their opinion matters. So if you have a child or a student who's really reluctant to use assistive technology and, and you're pushing it on them, it's not gonna benefit them if they don't want it or don't like it or don't think they need it. So it's important that you have that buy-in and you're considering their opinion throughout this process. It involves a lot of information gathering, decision-making and trial use. And we're gonna talk more about trial use as I talk about some of the programs that we offer. And one of them is the fact that we have a lending library or a try before you buy, which we like to call it program where you can borrow these devices before making a decision. Okay, so one of the ways that you can, that the team can assess AT needs is through information gathering and data collection. And there's something called the SET framework, S-E-T-T -T framework. And that stands for student environment, tasks, and tools. You as the parent or guardian can download um, from Joy Zabala, she is the person that created the SET framework. On her website, she not only explains what this is, but you can actually download worksheets that you can bring with you to an a, a, excuse me, to an IEP meeting, to an evaluation meeting, to the transition planning, and you can fill in each category where it talks about the student, it talks about their needs, and it talks about what they need in all environments in the school, what tasks they're struggling with, what things they're good at, and then coming up with a set of tools or AT that might support them. And I think it's phenomenal. It is free. Um, and that is one of the reasons I included the link here for you. Um, there's another set of screening tools. They're called the WATI, W-A-T-I. And that comes out of Wisconsin. Um, and again, it's a free publication on assistive technology consideration. And they also have different tools on how to organize this process. And so if you are a person who is going through this right now, I highly recommend that you download both of these assessment tools. Again, there's no cost, um, but it may help to organize your thoughts. And I like the set framework because it is so structured um, and I find it to be very helpful. Um, and it's, it should be done as a team. It's definitely not something that should fall on the shoulders of one individual or you as the parent. Okay, so uh, to expand on the set framework. So these are the questions that it's asking in that document under student. So what is, what is or are the functional areas of concern? What does the student need to be able to do that's difficult 
or impossible to do independently at this time. We know that children, as they grow, constantly are evolving and changing. And so this is something that should be done annually, just like an IEP meeting, because the key there in that sentence is at this time, because we know if they can't do it independently now, they may be able to do it independently next year or in two years, depending on that student. The environment, arrangements, so instructional and physical environments, supports, is there a support staff there? Would that make a difference? Are there available materials and equipment that they can access? So not just a textbook, but if, if the student needs a large print material, is that available to them? Are there access issues, hearing loss, vision loss, intellectual disabilities, whatever it may be, is the environment set up and conducive for that student to learn? Also the attitudes and expectations. We wanna make sure that we are assuming every student can learn and we just need to make sure we're providing the appropriate environment for them to do that. So next we have tasks. What is expected of all students? What does the targeted student need to accomplish? Right, and this, is, this goes in the IEP as well, making accommodations. So all students are expected to do X, but if we alter the assignment slightly, then we can say, okay, this student can do this. And we're gonna give them the same assignment, but possibly change the task to fit their needs. And last is tools. Solution generation, solution selection, um, and implementation. So solution generation, so coming up with a solution. And this is again, a team effort everyone kind of brainstorming and, and throwing out those ideas to generate some possible solutions and then selecting the appropriate tools that might accomplish that goal. So this is what the set framework looks like. The worksheet is going to ask these questions. It's going to be set up for you to fill in as a team. And if you have ideas, you can fill in your own prior to going into the meeting and then ask the special education teacher and whoever else works with your, your student to also fill in these. All right, so tool selection and device trials. So a thorough way of determining what AT can help it's like a matching, right? So you're matching the, fe the features determined from the set process to one or more, more alternatives. So looking at the framework, looking at the tool section, saying, I think they need a device to support them with handwriting. I think they need a device to help them hear better. I think they need a device to keep them organized. So once you look at those and you have categories, we have on our website, uh, techowlpa.org, hashtag, I mean, slash borrow, um, devices that you can borrow in all of these areas. And the easiest way to go in there on our website is to actually look at that heading, breaking it down by area of need, organization, thinking, learning, writing, hearing, vision. If you, if you go to directly to that area of need, you'll see all the different types of devices that we have for, to borrow in that area. And I'll talk more about our loan process in a few minutes. Also, Patan. Um, Patan has a lending library as well. And any student in school that needs assistive technology can get a device from them while they're in school during the school months, during the school year. Um, that's important difference to denote is that Patan, you can borrow the devices from September and usually by May, I believe you have to start sending those things back um, and they can only be used in the school setting. I 
don't know if those devices are allowed to go home. That's another really important thing to think about. Is this technology going to be allowed to be used in school and at home? Because if you've got a student using devices in school and then they, at home they have nothing, that is going to create a lot of frustration and it, it's not gonna be as beneficial, right? You wanna be able to make sure that the assistive technology that you're recommending, that you're suggesting for them is kind of across the board in all environments, in all settings, in order for them to really learn how to use it and to make a difference. All right, so the tool selection device trial is also an opportunity to look at, um, you know, determination. So what data are we looking for? And then when will we make a decision? So you should decide as a team right then and there, how long are we going to allow them to do a device trial? What information do we want to collect throughout that process? And when will we revisit this? I would always set a date. I would say three months or two months, depending on what their needs are as a team to revisit. Um, that's just me, I'm just throwing that out there. But I think it's really just based on the student's need and what the team feels would be best. Device trials should also be included in the IEP. Um, specifically, they wanna specify the AT service as well. Um, if they're just, borrowing a device, who's going to be supporting them with that device? Will there be therapies or services provided? Um, beginning dates, frequency, the location and duration. So in school, in the general education setting for one hour each day, five days a week, really specific. Um, at home while helping mom cook for 45 minutes, three days a week, um, specifying the device trial parameters so that you can really look at each one and decide if that is making a difference. Device trial plan should also include the device or devices to be tried, the goals and the scope of time, like I just mentioned, the means of acquiring them. So if that device needs to be purchased through uh, insurance, if it needs to be purchased um, with your own finances, if this is um, a student that, or a child that um, you can obtain this equipment for free from one of the programs that are offered, are you going to borrow that money? So really specific thinking about how will we obtain this device if it works? And how will we obtain it during the trial? Um, and then how the data will be collected and analyzed. Um, normally the special education team would have something in place already to handle that. And then that review date, as I mentioned. Um, and just to note, this device trial plan is not required by the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. This is just something that we refer to as best practices. Even though it's not required, this is, without doing this, you're not going to have all the information that you need to make the best decision. And hopefully you wouldn't get pushback from this, the IEP team but I just think it's important to note that. Okay. So on this screen, there is a picture of a cookbook and it says there is no cookbook approach to including assistive technology in the IEP. So include it what, wherever it seems appropriate to assure access to the assistive technology devices and services the student needs to benefit from a free and appropriate public education or FAPE. That's what it's referred to. Um, you can't add it in too many places because it needs to be clear that this is an important part of the education process. And there are no cookie cutter ways of doing it. All right. 
Okay. So these are all the places that it is supposed that documenting AT should appear in the IEP. Um, there's a lot of different sections to the IEP. Those of you who've been through this process know that. It, they can be 45 pages long and it can be painstaking to go through them. But if you focus your attention on the areas listed here, um, that is all the places that AT should appear. So we've got special considerations. There are present levels of academic achievement, uh, participation in state and local assessments, transition services, annual goals, program modifications and specially designed instruction or SDIs, you might see them referred to, and related services. Again, assistive technology is not just the device, it's the related services and the device working in tandem. And there's an image uh, on the screen of an animated image for different figures holding up a puzzle piece that looks like a globe or the earth. Okay, moving on. So I think I already went over this. Um, it just says, does the student need assistive technology services? and devices, they're, again, they're checking yes or no. And if they're checking yes, then that needs to be considered and what needs, what tools they're going to be using. Schools cannot limit AT to in-school use, but that being said, not all devices that are available at school must go home. So it really needs to be a conversation of, do they need to go home? It is an individual basis that that needs, the needs um, to be used for outside of the school environment, especially if the child has homework. If they're going home with homework and they need a device to do classwork, then they are going to probably need that device to go home, but not all devices are allowed to go home or available to go home. So that is something that you need to know and get clarification on before um, before putting, you know, before they actually obtain that device and make sure that it's in the IEP, that it is written clearly in there, whether that technology is going to be in school use only, or if that's coming home with them. Taking technology home, it is the school's responsibility, limited to those devices, needed for a student to pursue his or her educational objectives. And then other alternatives are permissible. So if a device is deemed appropriate, is for in-school use, but you need one at home as well, and the one that's in school can't go home, there are other options for you to getting a device that can be brought home or kept at home. But this is a conversation that needs to happen throughout the IEP and set process. Again, it's on a case by case basis, taking technology home. If the school is purchasing that AT device, they have the right to take it back and it, it can only be used throughout the school year. So it is tricky to figure out what's allowed to go home. It really depends on the team the type of assistive technology it is, um, and the source of, of acquiring that device. And um, yeah, the ITP team will determine the need to access those devices in all settings in order to provide the student with a free and public, free appropriate public education. So more information can be found about taking technology home I listed two websites here, ideapolicy.org, and the other one is, I forget what this stands for now, nasde.org. So both of them, you can find sections on taking assistive technology home. All right, so whose responsibility is it to provide AT? Ultimately, that responsibility rests with the school district. 
or the intermediate unit that that child is in. Um, there's no requirement that the device have to be new, just so you know. Um, and we do have a reuse equipment pro um, program at the Institute on Disabilities. The assistive technology must be educationally necessary and appropriate, but it does not have to be top of the line. There is no obligation for the school to provide the latest and greatest devices. And so a lot of times, if you recall in the beginning when I was showing the different types of technology, the Go Talk Now, which, I mean, I saw kids using, the last time I was in a classroom teaching was over six years ago, but kids were using that. And it's not a robust system and it's not the greatest system. And it's not like using uh, an iPad with Prolook or to go, which would be a much better robust communication system. But the districts are not required to provide the latest and greatest. They just need to provide something that's appropriate that supports the student in accessing the curriculum and those needs. So again, advocating for your child or student can be exhausting, but I think it's really important that you do that. Um, otherwise, you might, they might get stuck with something that's not great. So let me go back, sorry. Um, assistive technology resources for you. And this is gonna be key um, when I send the PowerPoint over. Um, if you want it, please request it. Um, I don't know if Disability Pride, I don't know if you guys are gonna be automatically sending out um, unless people request it. But if you need resources, I've got them for you. Um, and I know I gave you a lot of information, I'm sorry. Um, so learning more, here's some ways that you can do that. Um, get a device demonstration. Uh, at the Institute on Disabilities, we provide assistive technology device demonstrations. Of course, for this last year plus, since we've been working from home, that hasn't been an easy task, but we have been able to work around and do some things via virtual platforms and Zoom. Um, but this is a hands-on guided exploration of a device or group of devices. So if you say to me, Stacy, my, my child is hard of hearing and they need some type of assistive technology to support them in the classroom, I'm gonna pull out everything I have to support them and then we're gonna go through all of them and let you touch them, listen to them, talk about their features, the pros, the cons, the costs. That is what a hands-on guided exploration is. It is conducted by our trained assistive technology specialists. We have a phenomenal team with varied backgrounds and expertise. Um, we have one of my colleagues who is um, a blindness low vision expert CAD is certified, and um, she is phenomenal for all things blindness, low vision, and tech. She's very techy. Um, we have an occupational therapist on staff who is now 3D printing devices and can help with mobility and all types of concerns. So uh, the list goes on and on. We work with amazing people. So Anything that you need support on, we are available to help you. It's also free to all Pennsylvanians. That's a huge plus. Okay, uh, next is our device loan. I said it a few times, we have a lending library. The lending library is free to all Pennsylvanians with disabilities and older Pennsylvanians. This is our try before you buy program. You go onto our website, techlpa.org slash library, you sign up, then you search our inventory. We have hundreds of devices in all different areas of need. As I mentioned before, organization, thinking, mobility, vision, hearing, et cetera. You can borrow up to five devices at a time and we extended our loans. At one point, our loans were only two weeks. 
And then when the pandemic hit, we extended the loans to four weeks. And now you have nine weeks. And if you remember earlier, I said, when you're doing that set framework, two months should be an appropriate device trial. That means if you're borrowing a device from us or devices and you have nine weeks to use it, within those nine weeks, that should be ample time to start with one device, see how it goes, let the teachers take that data and then switch to another device. So you've got a little bit more than two months to borrow it. It is completely free. We UPS that equipment to you. We can send it to you as the parent. We could send it to the uh, therapist at the school, wherever it may be. Um, this is something you might wanna think about over summer break, um, doing these device trials. So then when September comes, you're ready to have that conversation with the school team. Okay, um, get it, give it, buy it, sell it, <laughs> or donate it. Um, we take used devices and tools um, from all over, from individuals. Um, we clean them up and then we are ready to give them away. So this is um, a way that it's like a Craigslist for assistive technology. Um, and that can be found at techlpa.org slash service. REAP, we call it REAP, it's our reused equipment exchange program. I think that's right, R-E-E-P. Um, and you can look on there to obtain devices. Sometimes people go through this process of getting letters of um, medical necessity and getting their insurance companies to purchase a device and they haven't trialed it. And then um, they realize it's not gonna work and they can't use it. And so sometimes they'll give it away, they'll give it to us. Other times people will sell things through our site, um, but most often they're free, so check it out. Um, we also have free special phones program for individuals who have hearing loss or combined hearing and vision loss, some of them, um, and that you do have to apply and be um, financially, there's like a financial requirement so you have to be eligible, but the application can also be found at the website provided here. If you want to learn more about special education resources and laws, rights law resource, is the website is here, and that will give you everything you need to know. Um, the Disability Rights Network, or DRMPA, there, I listed their website. Another way to get um, assistive technology is through the Pennsylvania AT Foundation or PHCF. Um, their website is listed. They have no interest in low interest loans for assistive technology devices. Um, if you can't purchase them through other methods, so Medicaid, waiver, private insurance, they will provide those. They also do have a grant program that is fairly new, and I don't want to misspeak because I don't know that much about it, um, but if you go to their website, you can look at all of the options for loans and for grants. If you support someone who uses AAC or augmentative communication for to communicate, so any kind of device, um, we do have a meetup um, once a month, and lots of resources can be found at aacommunity.net. My wonderful colleague, Catherine Helland uh, and Haley Strickler, who are speech and language pathologists and experts in AAC, um, write a blog on AAC community. They provide these meetups, so they're opportunities uh, in person when that resumes and online for individuals who use communication devices to kind of come together and just chat. Um, with their devices. Um, we also, they also do troubleshooting. Um, so fixing glitches or anything that needs to be reprogrammed. And the websites again for Wadi and uh, the set framework are here. Okay, this is the last thing. <laughs> so you may not be in Philadelphia or in the Philadelphia area and thinking, oh, I can't. I can't go to Temple University or contact the Institute on Disabilities because it's in Philly. That's not true. So 
Um, the Institute on Disabilities has, and Tech Owl, our team has nine resource centers that are statewide. So on the screen right now is a map of Pennsylvania and the locations of those resource centers. We have resource centers in Erie, Pittsburgh, St. Mary's, Camp Hill, Allentown, Williamsport, Scranton, and Washington Township. So statewide, as I mentioned, um, if you need a device demonstration, if you need support filling out any of our applications for our resources, you can contact those offices individually. And all of their contact information is also found on our website at techowlpa.org. Across the top, you would scroll to location and you'll find your, um, your regional office and all of the phone numbers and email addresses for the appropriate people will be listed there. And that way you can get in, in touch with someone closest to you. You can also call me. Um, and contact our office and we'll support you best we can. But as far as device demonstrations and any in-person evaluations, you definitely wanna reach out to your local resource center. Okay, so on the screen right now is a graphic. It just says, thank you in many different languages. I've talked your ears off. Um, I'm going to have, I have my contact information here. If you want to reach out to me, it is stacy.phillips at temple.edu. And there's no E in my first name. It is S-T-A-C-Y. A lot of times people throw an E in there just for fun. My phone number is listed. However, I've been working from home for a year and a half, I guess now. Um, and sometimes I forget to check the voicemail at the office. I'm gonna be honest with you. Um, it's best to email me. I will respond to you right away. I am so good about checking email. I have a little bit of OCD about it. I don't like things sitting in my inbox. So I'm, I'm very good at getting back within 24 hours. Um, you can also visit our website, like I said, techowlpa.org. Um, there is a link, the bit.ly link and a QR code here if you would be so kind to fill out a um, survey for me, for us, um, because what, everything we do is grant funded. We have to collect data on all of the trainings that we provide. And it might ask the title of the presentation, which is, you can just put uh, Disability Pride AT in the IEP. So if you have a phone handy, you can use your camera to scan the QR code. If not, if you go to the bit.ly, it's bit.ly slash piot underscore t1. And just ask a few questions about satisfaction, what you learned. Um, I hope that you learned something new and thank you. And now I will take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing. Wow, Stacy, so much to learn. <laughs> that was a lot of information. I know. So I, I'm sorry. I know. I, I sometimes go overboard, but I feel no. like I feel like as a former special ed teacher and as a parent with children with disabilities, there's so much to know. And if you don't know, then you don't know. Like you don't know what questions to ask you don't know the law. Like I was a special ed teacher prior to having kids with disabilities. Like, you know, so I had an advantage. I had a tactical advantage that many parents don't. Um, and I always tried to educate the families that I work with um, through the process so that they understood what was happening and what their rights were. Um, right. And, it was, it's it's great. Um, so uh, there are a couple questions in the chat, so I'll go through them. If anyone else has a question, you can use your um, little reaction um, buttons and raise your hand. Or um, after I read these, you could um, open your mic and ask. So um, there's a question that says, can you give us an example of a specific question to ask when discussing AT. 
I have previously mentioned AT at my son's team to assist him with learning, but they are st they steered me away from AT. They do not believe his needs need it, but I believe he can benefit from some of the apps or programs that are available. He is on the autism spectrum and currently uses an iPad and other things. I would prefer he use it for learning. That is a great question. Um, so I would be happy to put some specific questions together for you that you can ask if you want to email me. Um, I kind of would like to little to know a little bit more about his needs um, before I generate those for you. Um, but a general question or statement at the IEP meeting could be, We've been trying different types of assistive technology at home, and I feel this would benefit him or her in the school setting. I want an AT evaluation conducted. So as the parent, you have the right to ask for and advocate for what you want for that child. And that's exactly how I would say it. And a step beyond that, I would put it in writing. Anytime you put anything in writing to that school district, they are liable and mandated um, to provide that. And so if you put it in writing, I would save a copy for yourself. Make sure that you have the date on there. Um, be sure that you are putting your child's name, your name, and exactly what you want, that you want an AT consultation. I would make sure in addition that a copy of that goes to the special education teacher. Above them is usually a special education liaison or an SEL, that's what it's referred to, and the principal of that school. Um, make sure that you include that, your expectations, that they will get back to you and work on a plan within 30 days, because that's generally how much time they have to fulfill something like that. Wow, great answer. Okay. Can you tell me who asked that question? Yeah, just so that was, um, let me see, uh, Sudan um, okay. Bradley. Okay, Sudan, please, please email me and I will actually draft some questions for you. And if you want to have a conversation that's specific, I'm happy to do that as well. Awesome. So we have another question as I scroll down um, in the chat. And um, this is from Carla Mal Maldin, um, and it says, would the responsibility fall on the parent if the child is in early intervention preschool? Absolutely not. Early intervention is phenomenal, and anyone that has their child in EI um, should be getting every service <laughs> under the sun um, and no, the, the responsibility would not fall to you. The responsibility would fall to whoever's providing those early intervention services. And that's definitely a conversation you should have with whoever is providing those services. Um, and usually it comes from the state, so patent and their, their intermediate units. Um, would be the ones providing the early intervention services. And so, yeah, if you are looking, thinking that moving forward, that your child's going to need some form of assistive technology is a conversation you should have with, with them, with that provider. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand using the little reaction buttons. Uh, let me see if there's another question. You're welcome. Carla says thank you, and uh, mm -hmm. Sudan says thank you as well. My pleasure. Hey, Connie. I yes. want to make it. This is Vicki. 
Alan, just make a comment. Stacy. this was so much amazing information and the way that you broke it down made so much sense. Um, I only wish that this information was there when my son was in school mm. um, because so many of these, um, you know, uh, uh, practices and services would have just changed his life. Thank you. Yeah, I felt a lot of the time when I was teaching special ed and autism support, I felt the parents' frustration at the IEP meetings, and I could see the difference in the way that the administration interacted with the families and the way that I was interacting with the families. I was providing resources and, and telling them what their rights were. And the administration kept trying to pretend that the parents had no rights. Um, and that's why I didn't last long in the school district of Philadelphia. Because <laughs> um, I, I, I was like, man, I don't agree with what's happening here. Um, so yeah, I, I want people to be in Formed. I want you to have all of these resources because you should feel confident going into that IEP meeting and demanding what is rightfully yours for your child. So. I even find that there's a, some things that you were talking about that I could use for some of my own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I told Ray while we were while you were talking that I wanted a giant rubber band to put around the bottom of my my desk so that I because I'm constantly kicking the, the couch, which is in front of it at the moment, but it doesn't have that pushback, which, which I think would be really amazing for me. Yes. Oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> yeah. Dollar Store has the really, really large ones you can find. Sometimes you can find the really thick, uh, like two inch size, um, the bands. And then also I've seen it a lot lately on social media, people doing these workouts with those bands that go across your, your legs mm -hmm. um, that provide that, you know, that, that feedback. It's, it's a great stimulation tool. And if you put that on your coffee table, I think you'll be good to go. You'll be kicking it and you'll get that sensory input, you know, that you need. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. You there. It's surprising. You look around the house, you're like, oh, I have a lot of no tech assistive technology here, even not realizing it. Yeah. Stacy, you talk about the disconnect with the administration and the parents. Um, if, in your own opinion, um, can you talk about that? Is it stigma? Is it non-awareness? Is it obstinance? What, what, what's your opinion of, of the situation? Wow, that's a good question. Um, so some of the problem is that a lot of the administration in the schools, um, whether it be principals or testing coordinators, don't have a special education background. A lot of them have a general education uh, background. These are people that worked possibly at the, for the school district writing curriculum. Um, and they're more about numbers than they are about people. Um, and not everyone understands the needs of students with special education uh, needs and their families. Um, and so they run the school like a business, but it's not. Uh, and that is my issue with charter schools. Uh, my, my middle daughter, Transparency, just graduated from a charter school. Um, and I had so many issues with her attending when she started there. I did not want her to go. I am a huge proponent of public education, but 
I had to do ultimately what was best for her. And she's a performer and actress and wanted to go to a performing arts school. And this is the school she chose. And I had to kind of bite my tongue and let her go. Um, but charter schools are run like a business. They have a CEO, they say it right there. Uh, and they care a lot about their money. And the money does not necessarily come from Title I, which is how we get special education funding and low income um, students. Um, they care about uh, test scores and how they look on paper. Um, and a lot of the administration I, I worked with, really, it, it was like butting heads. It was very, very difficult for me for those 10 years um, to try to advocate for my families. Um, and I had families ultimately seek legal representation in order to get services that their child deserved that I was more than willing to provide and help them on, but I had uh, my principal above me saying, absolutely not, they don't need that. So oh, that's okay. my opinion. I mean, I think we'll leave it, but it, it, it is very challenging. And, and yeah, it seems like we have some work to do in, in bringing about education and awareness of disability rights. Um, we have a question from Sudan Bradley and their hand is up. So. Um, Sudan, the floor is yours, if you want to unmute. Hi, this is Sudan Bradley again. Hi. Um, yeah, I, so I find that in the education system, and much like you, I've been around um, working with um, kids with disabilities, and I right now work with individuals with hearing loss, but so I'm familiar with the technology and I'm familiar, I do educate myself about different technologies. And when my son was born, I found the harder task of having to advocate for him. That's why I asked the question. And it seems like within education, because he does get IE services, we're actually in a suburb of Philadelphia, which is great, but they tend to assume that the parent doesn't know anything. And when I would give them information, explain to them, I know where he is. And I had to advocate for him to get in a special school because I knew that he was regressing and I had to actually pretty much fight for him to get into that school and fight for them to understand and to see that they didn't give him everything in order to identify where he was reg regressing. So once he got into the school, it was another fight because it was, they put him in school where they thought he was more advanced than he was because he was very good at a certain level of skills, but they, he didn't have basics, which I tried to explain. And that was another fight. And then they, of course, realized it later on and then having to put him back. So he doesn't have, does well with trans, well, he does better now, but he didn't do well with transitions. So those things are things that I'm trying to avoid. And even in advocating for him, they still like steer you away or still, you know, act as the experts and feel like you don't really have that say. And that's why I asked the question, like, what are the specific questions? So they are aware that I am familiar with these services. I'm familiar with special education. I know that they try to provide the bare minimum, but I want my child to excel instead of just be the bare minimum. <laughs> well, Sudan, I, first I wanna say thank you. And um, I'm proud of you for fighting. Um, I also wanna say I feel you because I was there. Um, my son started kindergarten like every other kid, you know, just walked in first day. We thought everything would be fine. It was our local um, public school. And by week three, they told me they could not educate him and I needed to remove him from school. They obviously did not know that I was a former special ed teacher. And again, similar thing to you, they did not uh, take what I had to offer and what I had to say at face value. Instead, they were very quick to be dismissive 
of me. Um, and I also had to walk in there. And so we've spent the last hour plus together. You can tell that I'm a pretty positive bubbly person, but I had to walk into his school and act like someone I'm not, which is a very big B. I'm just gonna say B. Um, I went in there, <laughs> very straight faced, very angry and sat them down and told them, I have a master's in special education. I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to get me to remove my child from the school so that you're not liable for providing him with services. And that's not going to happen. And then I told them what they were going to do. I did not ask any questions. I said, you have not done a functional behavior assessment yet. You have only had him for three weeks. You have not come up with a plan of action. You have not provided me with any documentation of any observations that you've made. And so we're gonna start there. And this is what you're going to do. And then we're going to meet again in three weeks. Like I just had to lay it out there for them and I had to be very mean. And it's not in my nature to be like that. But that was the only way I could get them to do what they needed to do. And three months later, they offered approved private placement. And if you've ever advocated for approved private placement, you know this is not something that districts generally offer. This usually comes from years of fighting and battles with legal help. I did not have to hire a lawyer. I didn't have to do anything other than tell them and point out to them what they needed to do and what their responsibility was. And they realized that they could not educate him. And, you know, that's not what I wanted. Of course, I wanted my son to be able to attend our local public school, but it wasn't going to work for him. And they offered approved private placement. And when they did, I said, fine, then I will choose which school he goes to. And I will have private transportation. <laughs> so I advocated to the last minute. They wanted to put him on a yellow bus with 20 other kids and be on a bus for an hour and a half to school without a car seat at the age of five. And I was like, nope, that's not gonna happen. We're gonna get a private van and they're gonna come to my house and I'm gonna install my car seat. And then they're gonna take him to school, just him, no other kids, no other stops. It's a long enough ride. And that was it. Like I literally had to be so mean and I didn't ask them what they were gonna do. I told them what they were gonna do. And the special ed teacher sat down with me and she was young. And she wrote everything I said into that IEP before I signed it. And that's it. Here we are We're four years later. That's amazing. I, I appreciate this conversation just to know that I am doing the right thing because sometimes, like you said, I'm very much so a bubbly person as well. So it's, it's hard to be that mean person. But for my kids, kids, I feel like I have to do any and everything but you don't want to be that mean person and everyone looks at you like you're just the B, like you said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, my pleasure. I'm happy to have this conversation. Tony, you are on mute. Um, thank you both for entering in that discussion. So I think what's important is both of you have a sense of what your child needed. So I imagine that there is a majority of people who don't understand the needs of their, their child because for whatever reason, and they blindly, and that's the wrong word to use, but they go into a situation just listening to what the school district has to say. So I think conversations like this are really important. And my, uh, my question is like, do you do any general public um, conversations with people so they can begin to learn about um, IEPs and um, information about um, uh, assisted technology? That's a good question. I, I mean, I've spoken at dozens of conferences across the state um, and 
Um, I've had this conversation with any friends of mine that would listen. <laughs> um, I don't have any other general conversations, but um, if Disability Pride wants to put this presentation up on the website and let it live there, where anyone can pop on and access it, that would be great. And I would be happy to work with you guys to host conversations regularly about challenges that families are facing throughout the IEP process in general, not necessarily AT, but just in general, um, these conversations should be happening. And I know there's just amazing organizations across the state that are doing all of the, you know, all that they can. Um, so yeah, I, I would be happy to do that to kind of work with you guys to host like a monthly conversation um, support for families. So. Yeah, I think that would be fabulous because here, um, you know, just me for an example, I'm in higher education, but it, when it came to my children, I had no understanding of how to, how to even begin a conversation um, in regards to their learning. So I think really important conversation that you have to offer um, the general public um, as well as other people. Because a lot of times we talk amongst ourselves, so like organizations, people that have the same jobs, but it's other, other people that need to have the conversation too. So um, I think uh, Vicki said it was a great idea that we should host um, some more conversations. So thank you. My pleasure. Are, are there any other questions for Stacy while she's here? Any comments? Sounds like parents need to go on with like, I imagine this big warrior gear, you know, um, kind of like going to battle for your child to get a fair education. That's what it feels like. That's it does. Exactly what, yeah, that's exactly what it felt like. Um, I had to advocate for my oldest as well. Um, they have mental illness and went to Central High School and Central's a highly regarded academic institution in the Philadelphia area, if you're not familiar. And they didn't want to give um, Summer, that, that's my child's name, they didn't want to give them, you know, days off, mental health breaks, uh, days to go see therapists, you know, et cetera. But meanwhile, like they had a 4.0 GPA and missing a day of school wasn't going to hurt. You know, but they didn't understand it. I mean, I think things have changed now because they're 23 years old. But um, yeah, we need to be more aware and we need to educate families. Definitely. This, this is a hard process to navigate. Um, and if it wasn't my background, I really would have had no idea what to do. So really, really happy to be here. Really happy to have these conversations. When I say email me, reach out to me, I, I'm being very, very honest. I, I would love to speak with, with anyone who needs my, my support. And I might come up with a list of, of questions now, Sudan, you, you got me thinking um, that I need to do that. So I'm gonna start drafting a little frequently asked questions or questions to ask um, during this IEP process. That's awesome. And I think it's important that, um, you know, um, people understand the law of, of what is, um, how the law supports their child. Yeah. In a fair education. So. Yeah, and Stacy, um, I wanted to, you and I, of course, have conversation all the time, but um, I think you and I will have a conversation so that we can add a really good resource section on our website for for this information for people uh, that's um that's a great idea vicky but thank you so much for coming my pleasure
If there are no other questions or comments, I think we will wrap this session up. Stacy, you are a wealth of information and I'm, I'm so appreciative of your expertise. So thank you so much for being a part of Disability Pride Virtual PA. My pleasure, thank you. All right, everyone. Uh, we have, uh, this is our last day and we have lots of things going on. So um, tune in the rest of the day and um, we'll see you soon. Yes, thank you to Rita, Joe and Brandy. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you, beautiful interpreters. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye.